Okay, so uh, this is the last of the multi-include uh, webinars. Um, multi-include stands for multiplying evidence-based strategies for inclusion. Um, the, let's see if sound is on. Yes, okay. Um, the project uh, began in 2017. Uh, and now we are in the last few months, actually 10th in uh, January next year. Uh, and it's an EU funded uh, project by Erasmus Plus KA3 program. And it's aimed at policy for social inclusion through education, training and youth. Uh, the multi-include project intends to help educational organizations to deploy strategies in creating inclusive learning environments for youth in order to develop their sense of belonging in school, their community and society. We have uh, seven partners in the project consortium. The lead partner is the Hague University of Applied Sciences from the Netherlands. Then we have European School Heads Association, also from the Netherlands. We have Expertise Center for Diversity Policy from the Netherlands. We have Italian partner Associa Associazione di Scuola. We have University of Malmo from Sweden. We have uh, Kinder, Un uh, Kinder Un uh, Vien, uh, University uh, Children's <laughs> University from Austria. And we have Knowledge Innovation Center from Malta. And I didn't present myself. My name is Ivan Nastanev. I will be your host and I represent Knowledge Innovation Center from Malta. Uh, so the topic of... Uh, uh, just a second to, to detect who is with the music. Okay. So the last topic um, of the multi-include uh, webinar, final webinar, we chose uh, language, uh, multilingual education for social justice. Um, the idea for the webinar basically came because in the multi-include database, we had many interesting uh, success cases that dealt with uh, enabling education uh, for, for diverse groups of students in different languages. So we wanted to uh, bring uh, different experts uh, on this topic to share their best practices and also to engage in a discussion with them how we can enable uh, multilingual education and not make uh, some big fuss that costs a lot uh, or it's difficult to, uh, to, to start up. So uh, why do we think this is an important topic? Because language is a social practice, language is seen as a social practice and um, how we use the language has implications on social status, solidarity, distribution of social goods and power. So um, conscious engagement with the language will can contribute to uncovering and at the same time changing conditions of inequality in social, economic and cultural arenas. Um, why the topic of social justice? Um, in general, social justice refers to the relations between individual and society in which equal distribution of wealth and health and equal access to education and public services is ensured. Um, so we are looking uh, at how, for example, education um, can, can be um, seen through the uh, social justice uh, reference point of view and uh, how um, social justice uh, can be achieved um, and how we can achieve equitable and quality education for all students, no matter their, um, for example, language backgrounds. So the last thing I want to explain from the topic of the webinar is multilingual education, how we understand it, uh, it's um, the use of two or more languages as media of instruction in subjects other than languages, uh, other than uh, language subjects themselves. Uh, and uh, we, we like to see multilingual classrooms in the sense of children with many first languages can be part of uh, multilingual education, but only if all these languages are used for teaching and are meant to be developed further. Uh, in that uh, introduction, um, I would also like to uh, present who are our uh, guests today. We will first uh, have the opening uh, remarks by uh, Eva Vetter, who is a professor at the Center for Research into Language Teaching and Learning and Vice Head of the Center for Teacher Education at the University of Vienna. 
um, after Eva's presentation, we will hear from uh, Milica Rodic, who is currently employed at the uh, OSCE Mission to Serbia. OSCE stands for Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And Milica is working uh, on the topics of uh, the national minorities in Serbia and ensuring uh, equal access for education for national minorities, among other things that she is working on. Um, then we have uh, another presenter will be Mr. Vili Stotka who is also uh, from uh, one of the cases that we highlighted in the multi include, uh, which is State Europe School Berlin. And from 2009 to 2017, uh, Mr. Willi was coordinator for the SESB in the Ministry of Education of the Federal State of Berlin. After Willi, uh, we invite uh, Mary uh, Varsan Varsani, uh, who is a consultant, trainer, and teacher in the field of intercultural and inclusive education, stationed in Amsterdam. Um, she was a former curriculum coordinator of the sub super diverse school, school called Denise, nice. and she also helped establish the language friendly uh, school initiative. Uh, at the end, the uh, closing presentation will be by uh, Timothy Reed, uh, senior lecturer at the Department of Computer Languages and Systems at UNED in Madrid, who is also a co-founder of the Atlas Research Group and has directed several national and international funded projects on applying information and communication technologies to language for specific purposes. Uh, he's also the vice president of Eden. That's uh, all from my introduction. Uh, I would now like uh, Ms. Eva Vetter to, uh, to proceed with the presentation of the topic. Ivana, do you want the poll before Eva? Yes, you can start the poll uh, while Eva is presenting also. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Eva, just uh, unmute yourself. So, do I share my screen with you? Yes. Fine. So, thank you. Welcome. Um, I am very grateful uh, for this invitation, invitation because I love to talk about uh, multilingualism and multilingual education, which has come to be the focus of my research. I have been asked uh, to talk about a kind of conceptual basis and I'm more than happy uh, that my short input, it should be at about 10 minutes, will be followed by best practice examples with a particular focus on minority multilingualism, on immersion education, on migratory and refugee languages in education. Multilingualism research is nurtured by real life experiences of human beings. In, in institutions and in society. And it is to a high extent bottom-up research, which means going into the field, identifying a problem, analyzing it and trying to understand and learning from practice. In the following 10 minutes, I will limit myself to what I identify as the main messages uh, from decades of multilingualism research. Of course, it's a subjective um, choice. Um, I would like to begin uh, with the message, uh, multilingualism is not new. It has come to be different. Um, individual and societal multilingualism have a long history. Sometimes we tend to forget that. Societies are only rarely monolingual and states have always been multilingual. However, the so-called mobility turn at the end of the 20th century is evident in multilingualism and impacts upon how we look at multilingualism today. We talk about a space-time compression. Texts, languages are crossing boundaries easily and diverse temporal and geographical zones are brought closer people are crossing borders and many times they are risking their lives. Space-time compression means the mobility of things, ideas and people intensifies. 
and language plays an important role in this. Let me give you the example of my neighbors. They contact their family, the parents and the siblings living in Norway, German, Iran and Afghanistan via digital media and in the language Dari on a daily basis. They also use, of course, German. They follow the news in Farsi and sometimes English. It is not to say that language did not maintain family ties before, but the facilities of digital media allow us to compress time and space and this impacts upon language use on a regular and daily basis. So this is the first me message, multilingualism is different from what it was um, in the history of mankind. So second, this difference uh, questions traditional concepts. Traditional concepts such as, and we have talked about it, such as mother tongue, L1, L2, family, lang family language, and even the notion of language has come to be questioned. Linguists understand individual multilingualism now in terms of resources, of resources that may be partial, that are always incomplete and that are closely tied to experiences and practice and less tied to grammar. These resources constitute the individual repertoire. Hence, this individual repertoire consists of all the language related experiences and skills, also those that individuals do not actually use or need. We have learned from this that we have to clearly define what we mean when using a concept. And once we have to def have, have defined it, we have to conceive it as dynamic and not as fixed and static. European language policy is a good example for this move from fixed and static concepts, such as the mother tongue plus two policy towards more flexible and un flexible understandings. This is also the reason why the Council of Europe this time in the 2018 online published companion volume to the common European uh, frame framework of reference uh, does not mention mother tongue or foreign language or second language, but they name it language A, language B on page 200. And 50. So let me give you another example of a now 15 year old girl who understands but does not speak Kurdish, the language, the language that her mother uses at home. Arab is used at home too, together with Danish. She uses English with her siblings that she has learned from TV series during her, her many years of the way from Syria to Austria. What sense would the L1 concept make to her? What you see here is a kind of game we tried to build up the individual repertoires reduced to only the languages that the students use on a daily basis and to, to form it. And you see the forms, you see the very individual um, sculptures that the students have created here. Something that means my two languages that I use on a regular basis, they are not at all related. Here you see much more interrelatedness. So it's individual and on a mental level, it's interrelated, but uh, speakers con conceive it differently. So, the next point I would like, yeah, let's, oh. the next slide, why doesn't the next? So there's the poll, but not the next slide. I can't move to the next, I don't know why. Now, 
um, we have talked about the individual and the individuality of the linguistic repertoire. And of course, the individual and the societal multilingualism are linked. They are closely linked together. And education is, the, is a place, is one of the places where individual and society, societal multilingualism are linked, come together. And what I have created here is, um, is I tried to build up how this works in a, in the traditional schooling, the example is Austria, but it could be elsewhere. Uh, children come to school with a variety of language. They bring a variety of, of language of variants uh, with them. And at school, they are obliged to function in one language alone. Sometimes there is kind of heritage education, mother tongue education, and another language joins this one and only language. Most time it is English. Later on, other languages are added, the classical um, foreign languages like French, Russian, Italian or Spanish uh, for, the, for, for the example of Austria. Um, what you see here is that the languages that are added later on are not the same languages as those who, as those that the children bring with them. And um, this is where our topic, that means educational justice, comes in. And I would like to share with you uh, this sentence stemming from, stemming from Skutnap Kangas and Anna Malai. You can read it alone, of course. The indispensable place for dispensing social justice is education and the place of languages in education. This is what we are talking about. And this is what is questioned now in our societies, because not only in Austria, elsewhere in Europe and elsewhere in the world, we, we feel, we, we witness a very strong tendency towards the one and only language. And this silences the repertoire we have talked about. This also silences the cognitive potential of multilingualism. The epistemic function of multilingualism is largely hidden. And this potential of multilingualism for learning. As a consequence, the 15-year-old girl I have talked about is in class together with much younger children who are more competent in German. And she will stay there until she progresses, until she, she becomes better in German. And then she's allowed to move on. So um, this is the kind of injustice we are faced in multilingual situations like urban multilingualism now. Um, I would like to share with you now something that will help us to understand the alternative models that have developed in, um, in research in order to understand how we can, uh, in education, work, how we can treat, how we can negotiate multilingualism on a more productive basis. And so this is the model, and this is also my last message for you. Uh, there is no one size fits it all. What you see here is a kind of um, yeah, system in order to understand how multilingual uh, education works and which dimension we should talk about. First, we have the philosophy. Then we have the models. And third, we have what we normally look at, the programs. So the philosophy, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, do we understand multilingualism in our school as subtractive or additive? And of course, we all have learned that additive models and additive uh, philosophy, philosophy is more successful than subtractive multilingualism. Subtractive means taking away one language in order to uh, come to another language. Additive means uh, working on two or more languages. Then we have different models and these models are described in function of the aims. And uh, we can have the transi tra transitional model. This means a model bringing 
uh, children towards one language or the maintenance model uh, normally for minority education, the heritage model, this is often used for migration uh, minorities or the enrichment model where both can join. Then we are at the level of the programs. Uh, we distinguish between non-bilingual and here bilingual also means multilingual programs and bilingual or multilingual programs. And you see, we have quite a variety of models that bring us towards multi or bilingualism. Uh, immersion, two-way immersion are only two examples of it. So um, the important message is you have to be clear about your aim and you have to closely look at the context in order to decide which model fits uh, for whom. Yes, and then I have to figure, yeah, <laughs> in order to, to finish, I would like to share with you uh, the UNESCO text um, in the Guide for Ensuring Inclusion and Equity in Education, um, where it is clearly positioned, it is clearly stated that the principles of inclusion and equity are not only about access to education, but it is also about quality learning spaces, pedagogies that enable students to thrive, uh, to understand their realities and to work for a more just society. So to go forward. And here, let us come back to the graphic uh, before. Uh, if we, we think about traditional schooling, about how it works in the language education policy, in the mainstream education policy, we have at least three very important um, action points. First of all, when children come to school, guaranteeing access. And then when they are at school, and I think this is the most vulnerable point, the most difficult, um, guarantee participation in a multilingual or plur plurilingual manner. Plurilingual participation. This is where we have to really work on it. And then the third one is, um, yes, preparing them for a future that is, of course, a multilingual future. So let's come back to the four messages. Multilingualism is not new. Traditional concepts are tremendously put into question. In the, the individual is always linked to society. And there's no one size fits it all. This is, these are my messages for you. Danke fürs Zuhören. And yes, let's listen to the best practice examples. <laughs> Thank you, Eva, for the presentation. Uh, there was a reason we chose to have you for the opening because you kind of show us what are the possibilities that we still didn't explore. Because to me, how it seems is that uh, um, the theory went far beyond where we are now currently at the practice level. Even though we are doing amazing things and uh, moving things forward with, uh, with inclusion, uh, and with multilingual education in, in schools and in uh, higher education institutions, we are still maybe looking more at the traditional concepts that are being questioned. So I think that uh, having this uh, introduction was meant to kind of uh, think us harder how we can move forward in, in designing uh, inclusive classrooms. Um, I would now like to uh, intru introduce uh, Milica Rodic, uh, who is, as I said, working for uh, OSCE uh, Mission to Serbia. Before I uh, pass the floor to her, I would just like to, uh, to quote um, OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities, former, uh, former uh, High Commissioner, uh, Mr. Knut Wollebeck, who talking uh, one, on one occasion uh, to OSCE participating states, uh, he said that, um, uh, so addressing the challenges of linguistic management in the OSCE area, High Commissioner said, efforts to promote one language at the expense of another were particularly harmful. Such thinking is harmful not just to minorities, but also to majorities. When a majority demands mindless obedience and submission from a minority, this is usually regarded as subjugation and increases the chances of that majority not being respected. 
High Commissioner said. And I think that uh, Milica is doing, uh, Milica together with her colleagues at OIC is doing amazing work, uh, especially in the former conflict settings, uh, with the, especially with the work they did uh, in establishing multilingual um, faculty uh, in Bujanovac in South Serbia. So Milica, can you please explain us what are you doing and what are the um, some OIC standards and guidelines when it comes to multilingual education. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, hello to everyone. My name is Milic and I work for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in Europe, which is an international organization which has quite comprehensive approach to security issues. Uh, we are an organization comprised of uh, 57 participating states and all states have the equal status in this organization. Uh, all decisions are brought by consensus. However, those decisions are politically but not legally binding. In order to implement our quite broad mandate, the organization has uh, different structures, um, institutions, but also field missions like the one which was established in Serbia back in 2001 on the call of uh, the government of this country. And uh, since the very beginning, our work has been focused also on work pertaining to national minorities and integration of diverse societies. And as Ivana mentioned uh, previously, um, we within our national minorities portfolio, we work on various topics and issues such as access to education, access to justice, official use of languages and scripts of national minorities, right to inscription of personal names in official documents and records also in uh, native scripts. But we also work on creating a uh, possibility for people coming from different communities to communicate with each other because this is the essence of integration of diverse societies. Um, I also mentioned that we as an organization, we have ver various institutions, even I just mentioned one of them. This is a High Commissioner on National Minorities Institution based in the Netherlands in The Hague, uh, which was established as a conflict prevention mechanism. And this institution creates different documents and policies and guidelines and recommendations to all participating states in order to address the issues of minority concerns and uh, to help them to reduce inter-ethnic tensions which might lead to inter-ethnic conflict. And we as a mission, we rely a lot in our work on, on these documents produced by the HCNM. And also in this work which uh, I will present to you today, uh, we also used some of the documents uh, produced by HCNM. Uh, due to limited amount of time, I will just mention them. So all of you who are interested in the topic, I would strongly encourage you to find these documents on the internet. Uh, these are Ljubljana guidelines on integration of diverse societies and Hague recommendations on education of national minorities. And although not legally but politically binding uh, documents, once translated into policies and into actions, they represent incredibly powerful tool to, to intervene in, in societies. When it comes to Serbia, I will just um, give you an overview uh, when it comes to education and presence of different languages in formal education. Uh, we have 23 officially recognized national minorities and all of them at different level practice their right to use their language in official education. So basically we have two models on their disposal. Uh, within first model, uh, students from ethnic minority backgrounds have complete education in the official language. In this case, this is Serbian language and they're offered classes where they can acquire the knowledge on their cultures, but also to acquire proficiency in their first or native or mother language. Uh, we still don't have consensus which terminology is uh, uh, better to, to be used, to, which fits into the needs and reality. 
uh, basically these classes are not only offered to members to national minority communities, but also to majority community. And this can be also envisaged as one of the steps in integration efforts. The second model is currently practiced by eight national, national minority communities. And it allows complete education in a uh, language of national minority. And among these eight communities, Albanian communities also exercising this right to have complete education in their mother tongue. So basically from preschool education to elementary education and secondary education, these eight communities, including Albanian community, have right and they're exercising this right to have education in their mother tongue. However, when it comes to university um, education, the situation is completely different because there are just a few uh, universities across the country which offer some type of um, tuition in, with instruction in a language of national minority. And until 2012, that was not the case with Albanian language. It was not a language of instruction at the level of university uh, education. So due to that reason, um, young Albanians who wanted to pursue their academic careers uh, in their native language, they opted to, to study elsewhere in the region where they could exercise this right and uh, where they could acquire university degree uh, diploma in their native language. So we as a country, basically, we are facing a brain drain due to this reason. For these uh, young people who decide to come back to places of uh, their origin, they're facing actually additional administrative obstacles which can hinder any future integration effort. So basically, they uh, once they come to Serbia and if they want to apply for any job for which is acquired university diploma, they have to certify their uh, university diploma acquired outside of Serbia. So this is not only for the region, but this is the case for any diploma acquired elsewhere, but, but in Serbia. So basically, this is quite lengthy and tiring, but also expensive process. But also, I might say, it is also unfair process to persons belonging to national minorities, because since uh, curricula from Serbian universities and other universities do not match, these young people are asked to uh, pass additional exams in Serbian language. So just Try to imagine yourself in the same position when you acquired complete uh, education in your native language and you're not proficient user of Serbian as a state language and especially you do not know professional terminology in the state language and you're asked to pass exams in that language in order your diploma to be certified and recognized. So basically it was necessary to address this issue in institutions and more sustainable and systematic manner. And for this reason, we as the mission, we decided to support institutional uh, initiative, which in the end, after many years, resulted in the opening of the first university in South Serbia, which offers uh, instruction also in Albanian language. But before that, we spent a couple of years in, in preparation phase because um, all policies, especially uh, integration policies, needs a certain amount of time and needs, we all of us had to be cautious in order to draft the best policies which would give desired and needed results. So basically, all integration policies have to be drafted in inclusive, transparent and participatory manner meaning that it was necessary all relevant stakeholders to be involved in the process, in the decision-making process from the onset of the activity. Not only stakeholders from the level of central institutions, but also local institutions, but what was of the utmost importance was to have involved representatives and members of local communities with emphasis on a local Albanian community. Otherwise, all those efforts, no matter how they are noble and nice, would be perceived as something imposed onto them. 
Also, besides ensuring participation of all relevant parties with emphasis on uh, local stakeholders and local community leaders, it was necessary to have evidence-based approach, something that uh, Eva also referred to in her um, introductory remarks. So basically, it was necessary to, to feel the pulse of the community, to approach to young people, to, to ask them about their opinions, their views, their needs, uh, their wishes, and maybe even their fears, their willingness to stay in the place of their origin and to acquire uh, higher uh, education knowledge. At the same time, we had to act also as um, a social anthropologists and to understand actually the, the culture of the region and the culture of community. And we're talking about quiet traditional uh, communities. And for that reason, at the same time, it was necessary also to approach the parents of these young people, because still these uh, parents have immense influence in the future and selection of future profession of, of their kids. So it was necessary actually to take into account both of these components and to spend certain amount of time to do proper assessment and to see what is the opinion of community. Also, at the very beginning, all of us, we were aware that uh, it's not just the idea to establish university and just like that to print diplomas, but we had to think uh, about uh, those young people and to think about the future of the region uh, a few years in advance and actually to analyze the local labor market to see what are the professions that are insufficient and which professions could be in a couple of years easily absorbed at the local and regional uh, labor markets. So as I said, we spent a few years in uh, preparation phase and we managed uh, together with all relevant stakeholders to open um, first higher education institution in this part of the region. This is the Department of Faculty of Economics which belonged originally to University of Novi Sad, which is south of the country. And uh, they decided to uh, establish higher education institution in south of the country. Basically, the model that has been introduced is of great importance because it is addressing two issues. The first issue is this democratic pr principle, which relates to access to education uh, to persons belonging to national minorities. So basically, young Albanians for the first time have opportunity to study also in their native, their mother tongue in the country of their origin. So with this model, they are uh, given opportunity to pass entry exams uh, in order to be enrolled in this higher education institution, which is natural indeed, because they acquired uh, both elementary and secondary education in Albanian language. Also throughout the years, they are uh, following the classes also in Albanian as their first or mother tongue. And uh, this number of classes uh, progressively uh, decreases over the years. But what is also important, this institution has this high integration potential and capacity because it enables young Albanians to be proficient users of Serbian language. And this is actually a topic maybe for some other, um, some other event because we as a mission, we also work in helping uh, people from ethnic communities to learn Serbian as a state language. But this is something which is provided within this institution. And what is personally for me uh, of utmost importance uh, when it comes to integration, for the first time after so many years, young people from Roma, Albanian and Serbian ethnic communities sit together in the classroom from the very beginning of, of their studies. So this is actually important that for the first time they have institutionally provided space that they can sit together, they can know each other, they can meet each other, they can actually in the end uh, create shared identity. So basically these young people have created additional community within the region of South Serbia. This is community of students and they for the first time after so many years have created shared identity which is of utmost for any integration effort. 
So given actually the, the time which is dedicated for, for each of presenter, I would rather stop now because I can talk about uh, this and other mission uh, initiatives um, for ages, or for hours and, and for days. But I would not hijack this, this event, especially because we also have three wonderful uh, speakers. But indeed, in case that you have any question related to, to this initiative or any other missions initiative, I would be gladly to, I would gladly uh, answer to, to your questions. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Milica. I shared in chat uh, more about uh, your case, uh, the, the, the famous short movie that was made by OSE about the uh, department in Bujanovic. So if people want to get, know, they, get, get to know more, they can also click on that link. Um, I was very eager to have you as a presenter because I, I know how the whole process looked like. And I, I remember when living in Serbia, what was the level of inclusion of stakeholders? And I think that really shows the good practice. And that's why uh, we wanted to have you to, to present it because it really uh, had uh, in thought, in design to include everyone, especially as you say, parents, also uh, Albanian National Council, students, uh, potential future students, students who were studying abroad. So I think it really is, um, is a great example. Um, thank you. Uh, now, I think that we can move to another great example, uh, this time from Germany, that was also very inclusive uh, when it was uh, being made. And uh, it will be presented by uh, Willy Stotka, um, who, as I said in, in the introduction, served as a coordinator for State Europe School Berlin from 2009 to 2017 in the Ministry of Education of the Federal State of Berlin. Um, the thing about uh, State Europe School Berlin and why is it among uh, highlighted cases uh, in the multi-include database is that they have the uh, nine modalities of uh, bilingual uh, teaching and learning uh, in nine um, different language combinations. But I, can, I think that uh, Willy can talk more about it and he can also present the results from evaluations that they received, uh, how this model is actually working and um, what is the benefit for the community. Uh, Willy? Yes. Uh, maybe just unmute. You hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. And thank you very much that I can take part in this webinar and present the school model. <clears throat> I call it model. Uh, following Eva, it would be um, um, a program <clears throat> that, in my opinion, has to be copied in, in many countries and cities. Multilingual education for social justice. And nowadays, Europe, we see a lot of social injustice and we have the means to fight it and education is one of these means. Education can't eliminate social injustice but on the other hand you won't eliminate social injustice without an adequate educational system and multilingualism should be one of our most important answers in our multilingual and multicultural societies. I would like to yeah, <clears throat> so it works. In my lecture, I would like to explain in a very compact way the model or program of the Staatliche Europa Schule Berlin. Uh, you can read more information and even watch a short film about it in the multi include website. And then I, I go over to speak about the most important results of a scientific evaluation, which was carried out from 2014 to 2016. <clears throat> Staatliche Europa Schule Berlin, State European School of Berlin. The name is very long, so we used to say SESB. The SESB realizes its classes in dual immersion. What means that half of the lessons are given in one and the other half in the other language. Namely, from the first school day until the, the last exam, the German Abitur. And this school is state run. That means it is open for everybody and is free for everybody, in contrast to several private bilingual schools that exist. Uh, 
<clears throat> at the moment, there are nine linguistic combinations with 10 languages in 18 primary schools and 15 secondary schools. That means there are 33 different schools and each one of them works with one of these linguistic combinations. Normally, you, as when you are six years old, <laughs> you begin to study in the first grade of primary school. Then from seventh grade on, you have to change to the correspondent secondary school. That means the one that offers the same language combination. Totally, we have around 7,000 students in the, in the whole SUSB network at the moment. The principle is 50%, 50%. Half of the lessons are in German. The other half is in the so-called non-German partner language. <clears throat> part of the students are German native speakers. The other part comes from the other language. And well, in reality, a good part of them are already more or less bilingual when they begin school. But nearly always one language is the stronger one. The teachers <clears throat> are native speakers and exclusively teach in their first language or heritage language or mother tongue, how you want to call it. The ideal is that the educational staff consists of native speakers too. Each subject has its language. Since there are different subjects in the first part of primary and this last grades of primary and still different in secondary, I will try to explain it with a simplified example referring to the first four grades of primary and taking Spanish as synonym for all non-German partner languages. You see, there is German as first language for the German natives and German as partner language for the Spanish natives and the other way around in Spanish. <clears throat> Mathematics in German, general subject in Spanish, art in German and music in Spanish. This can be changed, art in Spanish and music in, in, in German. Decisive is the equivalence between the two languages. The scientific evaluation that was carried out in the three years from 2014 to 2016 by Max Planck Institute für Bildungsforschung Berlin and Christian Albrechts University zu Kiel tried to find out if SEFB meets its requirements. The results were published in this book and a lot of information on this website too. These were the main questions of the research. Do SESB students achieve bilingualism and on which level? To which levels do they get in the non-linguistic subjects like mathematics, natural sciences and so on, bearing in mind that they study part of these subjects exclusively in the non-German language, which is second language for the, for the, for the German speakers, and the other part in German, which is second language for the, for, the, for the other students. And last question, maybe for us, the most important, does SESB contribute to the compensation of educational disadvantages of immigrated children? Just a moment. <clears throat> the research was carried out in a parallel way in fourth to sixth grade and in primary and in ninth grade and secondary school. And here I only refer to ninth grade results. Um, the items in which the achieved levels of the students were researched were reading comprehension in German, reading comprehension in the non-German partner language, and, and you will see that uh, this was very important, reading comprehension in English, which is, which is L3 or, or the first language for all SESB students, apart from the German-English language combination. Um, and the achieved competences in the non-linguistic subjects, mathematics, in German, physics and chemistry in German, biology in the non-German language. <clears throat> Which were the groups of comparison? The SSB students were compared with students of regular, we call them regular, uh, 
we don't have another name, <laughs> Mon monolingually teached classes. Both groups were subdivided in monolingually grown up German and non-German students and bilingually grown up students. A great advantage for the research was that the authors had access to all PISA results of the countries where our partner languages are speaking. So they could compare results in the SESB non-German partner language with the levels in the countries of origin. Now, at last, the results you are expecting unpatiently. <laughs> I'm sorry that these figures are in German and, and just in gray. Uh, they are taken from the book I mentioned and I try to explain them to you in English. Reading comprehension in German, the light gray parts, the light, light gray bars refer to the regular monolinguistic classes, the dark gray to SESB students. You see that all groups, monolingual Germans, bilinguals and monolingual non-Germans achieve a higher level in German reading in the SESB. Important, please observe that SESB students during their nine years of schools have had only half of the classes in German. Reading comprehension in the non-German partner languages, that means SESB compared with PISA results of the respective countries. I can show you a figure, but I can report to you the following. The results varied between the different languages, but generally the SESB level lies below the average level in the original countries. Well, that was not surprising since in those countries, it's the majority language of communication, communi communication. but two thirds of the SESB students achieve PISA level two. And that means a linguistic level that is necessary to manage any all day situation in ninth class. And one third even gets to level three, that is academic level. Really spectacular are the results regarding the third language. You know, English is a foreign language for SESB students. It's their third language. And uh, as I explained to you before, and um, the difference between uh, SESB students and, and regular students is they begin to study this language two years later than regular students in German monolingual classes. That means at fifth grade instead of third grade. And now look at the results in ninth grade. SESB students have a higher competence level. And what you see in the figure seems less than in reality. This difference, this difference means, um, it corresponds to one year of learning. This means that developed bilingualism does not only mean one more language, but it increases also the capacity to learn a third and more languages. Mathematics, teached in German throughout all SESB grades. The non-German speaking, these one, and especially the bilingual students have a clear advantage compared with regular students. students. In natural sciences in German, you have a very similar result. In natural sciences in the non-German language, which is biology, the achieved levels are rather near to the standard level, what means studying biology in, for example, in Spanish, is no disadvantage for German students. Well, so does SESB compensate the educational disadvantages of immigrated children? Unfortunately, just gradually but not totally. If we take the average level of monolingual German speaking students in regular classes as the reference level, I'll show it to you. You see it, and this is this line, this line is the, the reference level. It's the level that, that uh, uh, to, uh, to where get the monolingual students in monolingual regular classes. This reference level, if you, if you compare it, you see bilingual, bilingual students in, in, in SSB 
approach, uh, get to this level. But monolingual, not. They, um, they get nearer than students in regular classes, but not far enough. You have the same, you th the same uh, um, scene in mathematics, and you have the same, the same scene in German as a, a comprehension uh, of German texts. In other words, we still haven't reached what we want, but we are on the right way. And we have to look ourselves at how we can improve our methods and system. Conclusion. Altogether, at the end of sec secondary one, students show linguistic and non-linguistic competences that are least, at least comparable to those of the regular monolingual schools. Deficits in the results of students with German as second language are also seen in the SSB, but they are mostly smaller than in the regular schools. While the results in the German language does not suffer as a result of bilingual classes, the SSB students acquire the respective partner language on an, on an internationally comparable level. And additionally, the SSB manages to teach a third language on a high level. With any of your questions that, can, that we can't answer in this webinar, you should consult these directions. The first one is the official public administration, the Ministry, Ministry of Education of Berlin. The second one is the AG SESB in the Europa Union, a non-governmental committee of parents, teachers, and others that is accompanying and supporting SSB since its origin in 1991, 92, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, so many thanks for your attention. Okay, sorry. Uh, at the same time, I was trying to share the link to SESB uh, highlighted case in the multi-inclusive database. Thank you, Vili. I think this was uh, really impressive because uh, very often we lack this type of data when we speak about uh, inclusive education in terms of uh, multilingual education. I think that this kind of gives us all uh, hopes and uh, also scientific proof that we can take to schools and then say, listen, this is the reason and why, why we can and why we should uh, support these types of initiatives. Um, thank you. I think that uh, we, we learned a lot and uh, I hope that we will be seeing more um, evaluations and uh, results from uh, these types of initiatives in the future as well. Uh, now I would like to ask uh, Mari if, uh, if she can present uh, more about the, the work that she has been doing with the super diverse school Denise in Amsterdam and the work she has been doing with the language friendly school initiative. Uh, Mari also presented something, prepared something uh, practical for the end uh, that everyone can benefit from and it's a blog, I will share the link later, blog with um, five practical tips for teachers that you can um, immediately uh, start multilingual practice in your environment or in your classroom. So uh, we will share that later. Mari, please. Ivana, before Mari starts, uh, yeah. do you think it should be okay to launch the second poll? Uh, let's let's do it between Mari and Tim uh, again while I'm speaking because we just have another poll to see uh, your uh, practice with the multilingual education um, from from the attendees. But we can do that in between because Mari prepared this nice <laughs> PPT, so we don't want to spoil it with the poll. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. No worries. Um, so everybody can see my screen now, right? Just checking. Yes. Okay. Great. Welcome everybody, um, my name is Mari Varshani and as a teacher in the group I would like to present you five simple steps for making space for multilingualism. I'm also going to introduce um, this topic by a little bit of personal background and a country-specific introduction. Um, 
So I was born in Hungary and at the age of 10, I started attending an Austrian uh, school in Hungary. So it was a bilingual program and it was a language immersion program um, in the sense that I was following a couple of subjects fully in German. And within the context of those subjects, I felt like this baby thrown into the water without knowing how to swim, except this baby looks quite happy and I was not. Um, I was struggling to follow the curriculum and during those classes. Luckily, I didn't give up learning languages and by the age of 24, I was a happy multilingual speaking or reading six different languages. So I was enjoying my multilingualism until in that year I moved to the Netherlands, where I felt muted, as Eva put it, I felt silenced in all of my languages. Um, and English, of course, was a language that could help me out in some of the context, but not in all. And so I felt like the only thing um, that really mattered was how good my Dutch was. This is actually a sentiment that was playing somewhere in the background in the Netherlands at that time, as you can see from this poster. This poster comes from 2014 and it was a political campaign um, in Rotterdam coming from the governing party, so the party that is also today still in charge. And the poster says in Rotterdam we speak Dutch. So there was this um, idea playing also in the public sphere of silencing other languages and of the only language um, that we give space to being Dutch. Um, luckily that there was quite an uproar around these posters and this campaign and the posters got removed quite quickly. However, that doesn't mean that this sentiment disappeared altogether. This can also be seen from education. So what we could, what we could see throughout the entire decade and what we still see in the Dutch education field is an obsession, a fascination with the word and with the idea of language deficit called Tal Ochterstone in Dutch. Um, this is a label that is very, very easily given to multilingual students. However, if you look at the pictures that I've put here, these are the results from a Google Images search for the word Tal Ochterstone. This is not simply a label. There is actually a racialized and um, a racial ethnic subtext to this label of language deficit of students with language deficit. And the problem is that this, um, this idea of this problem of multilingual students has actually uh, led to schools banning multilingual students or ban banning um, their languages. And um, you can even find today schools in Amsterdam with posters hanging saying here, we only speak Dutch. Of course, the posters would be in Dutch, but this would be the message. And this is despite the fact that we know from research um, how harmful such practices are for multilingual students and their well being. To, to quote Jim Cummins, the godfather of bilingual education, to reject a child's language at school is to reject the child. Um, this is something that we know from research to be a lived experience among children. And I personally can strengthen that this is how uh, I felt as a child when my languages did not matter. And also as an ad adult, when I felt like I was silenced in all the languages that I did speak. Now, luckily, not everybody shared this sentiment in the Netherlands. Um, and one person that was brave enough to go against the tide um, was my ex-headmaster, who actually is here with us today, Leonard Jan Feldhausen, who dreamt up a new school concept. Um, his idea was to give newly arrived immigrants a chance to study in a rich learning environment, um, which, uh, which was very unique because usually those students would be put into a Dutch program. So you would arrive to the Netherlands as a newly arrived immigrant and what you would be studying at that point for a year was mostly Dutch. So the, the new International School Esprit de Nice was born mostly to go against this idea and to offer students a rich curriculum, partly in Dutch, uh, partly in English, 
but also really focusing on the curriculum. I was asked to join Denise at the very, very beginning. And so I could help conceptualize the primary school section of Denise. Um, of course, what I wanted to do here was to give space to multil multilingualism and to give space to cultural diversity, which was also very needed if we look at the data from Denise from the year of 2017. As you see, the school had 38 home languages, and this is only data coming from the secondary school. So if you would have added the primary school, we would have had an even bigger number. So this was a super diverse school, it still is today. And, and me as a curriculum coordinator and the language teacher and a teacher of intercultural competence, I wanted to start experimenting and to see what I could do with the multilingualism present in the school. And so I would like to share with you five simple steps, five best practices that me and colleagues have, have uh, um, developed at Denise to make space for multilingualism. Step one is an idea that I'm sure many of you have seen, many of you are familiar with, to hang up welcome posters. So this is a super, super simple idea, but it is very powerful. Welcome posters are posters in which you say the word welcome, hello, or how are you in all the languages present in the school or in all the languages present in your classroom. Here you see Pepita Franke, who is one of the classroom teachers at Denise and um, her classroom. She actually asked the parents to make a poster. And this is a fantastic way for you to reach out to parents and to ask them to show their presence in the school. So the parents very happily prepared this poster and it has been hanging in the school ever since. This way, everybody coming into the school can recognize themselves immediately and you show that you are supporting, that you are acknowledging all the languages. You can go further um, as we see with step two, you can label items and concepts. Here I'm showing you two different activities that we did. On the left, um, you see a labeling activity. This was done by a colleague of mine on the first day of many of, uh, of our new students. These students came, came in from very different backgrounds and it was their first ever day on, in a Dutch school. Okay, so you can imagine how they felt lost and not being able to communicate. They, they did not share a language with their teachers. So my colleague asked them to walk around. She showed them what to do and to label anything they found in any language that they did speak. And so the students started doing it. And after 10 minutes, you could see the school environment covered in these multilingual labels. And after really just 10, 15 minutes, those students felt at home. They could relax because they could show that they belong to this school that they're part of the school and that they are able to do something even though they don't speak Dutch. Uh, what you see on the right side is another poster that I created with students um, with the word change. I started this poster because we were developing, we were starting a new project, a new unit on the topic of community and I wanted my students to, um, I wanted to make sure that my students understand the main concepts as some of them were quite abstract. So I gave them the main concepts, the main words, and I asked them to translate all of those words into their languages and to create these posters. As you can see, they were very enthusiastic about this. I, I did not ask them to decorate a poster, but apparently they felt ownership of it. So they started uh, making sure that the poster would be a beautiful poster. We put up all of these posters in the classroom for the duration of the topic, because this way the students could also fall back on it anytime that they would forget what change actually meant. Okay, so these are, these are again, super simple ways to make space for the students' multilingualism. However, what you also want to do is to look at each student individually. And so you can explore your students' language repertoire which languages do they speak? What did they do with the different languages as we have also heard from Eva, for example. Um, on the left side, you see the activity that I labeled my body, my languages, my languages. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this idea. It's super simple, but very powerful. What you ask your students to do here is to choose a color for every language that they speak. 
and then you ask them to color in their body outline um, and with those colors show you where the languages belong in their body. Now, of course, that sounds a little bit abstract, but um, uh, the beauty of this activity is actually how flexible it is and how much room it gives for the students for their own interpretation of their languages and how they belong in their body. I have done this activity with four-year-olds, but I have also done it with 17-year-olds and it just works. Every student can relate to it and they're very, very proud to later share their work uh, with with their peers and with their teachers. The other activity that you see here on the right, um, my languages and I, this is about how the students use their languages. What are the activities that they carry out in their languages? So you ask your students to create a Venn diagram to show which activities they only do in one language and which activities do they actually do in two or three or maybe four of their languages. While my students were preparing this activity, I had an eight, eight year old who all of a sudden shouted out saying, I love in English. And I thought that was super charming and very original. And this is really the engagement that you get when you ask your students about your languages. So if you try out either of these, I really encourage you to give space for a discussion afterwards and make sure that your students can share their work as they are very proud to do so. You can, um, you can download both of these activities for free if you go to my website, www.humaned.org, resources, and then download the portfolio. Moving on to step four, you can also send out vocabulary lists. So what we've been looking uh, up until now was mostly how to help your students feel that they belong and show their languages. However, as, we, as the other speakers have mentioned before, we also want our students to be able to access the curriculum. Okay, and this is one of the ways to help them do so. What you see on the left uh, column are a couple of key words belonging to the topic of plants um, that one of my colleagues was going to work on in the upcoming month or month and a half with her students. So she sent home this list asking the parents to discuss these words in their home languages and then to also translate them to the whole home languages. The reason we wanted to do this is that we wanted to make sure the students come prepared, that when they, and when they embark on this new unit, they already understand the main concepts and they can actually think and talk about them in their first languages, which makes it much easier for them to then access this curriculum in the target language. This is also a great way for youth to start cooperating with the parents because the parents um, can really help you in these ways to support, um, to support their children in understanding the school language and the curriculum. And finally, I would like to encourage you to let your students prepare for assignments in the language of their choice. Um, why am I asking you to do this? If you don't do this, if you only ask your students what they are able to do in the target language, if you only allow them to show it in their target language, you're not actually going to see what your students know. You're only going to see what your students are able to show you in the target language, which is not necessarily the same. So what I did here is I let my students prepare assignments such as essays or speeches or presentations in any language they wanted. Okay, the final product I still had to hand in in the target language, which in this case was English. Um, I have seen a really hard to motivate student uh, give an excellent presentation by preparing it in this way. He did all the preparation in Russian and finally he gave the speech in English and his speech was very, very strong. It was really strong content wise, but also I had never heard him speak such high quality, such high level of English before. Okay, so clearly the preparation in Russian helped also activate his English knowledge and this way he could give a better presentation. So these are just five tips, but with these five tips you can get quite far. And making space for multilingualism in school, I would like to finish with this, 
it helps students feel that they belong. It gives students more equal chances. It also strengthens the parent involvement, which is a known indicator for better learning outcomes. And finally, making space for multilingualism in school is simple, as you see in these five steps, and it's absolutely for free, right? So I feel that we have run out of excuses to not make space for multilingualism in school. And so I would like to encourage you to ask you to join us in this mission in creating more equitable space for our children in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm very happy that um, our colleague from uh, Asha, uh, Esther, uh, recommended that we invite you on this uh, webinar as a speaker. I think that this was very smooth transition into very practical tips what teachers can do starting from tomorrow. And it costs nothing, as you said, but it gives a lot to students um, and uh, also to parents in the community. Thank you, Sandra, for reminding me that we have another poll because we would very much like to know um, where you stand with the multilingual education practice. So if you can, uh, while I'm speaking, if you can answer this question, that would be nice. Um, next speaker, I think, is also a good transition from Mary because Mary, you, uh, Mary, you somehow shared things that are kind of analog still, what we can do with paper and pen. Uh, while my next, our next speaker, Timothy Reed, the senior lecturer at UNED, um, can tell us more about uh, computer-assisted uh, language learning and how mobile learning and e-learning can support inclusion, um, specifically having in mind multilingual education of diverse student population. And um, uh, Timothy is also a colleague from another uh, project that we worked together at KIC and UNED, and that's uh, Moonlight, and I think that the team will also mention it. And it's uh, using MOOCs to support uh, refugees and migrants upon moving to another country and uh, basically uh, having their language competences um, enhanced through MOOC. So, Tim, please. Um, continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivana, and thank you very much for the invitation to participate in today's event. Okay, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, applying technology to language learning for, for social inclusion. Um, you've got the title on the, the slide here, and um, I'm sure you're familiar with MOOCs, Massive Open and Online Courses, and I'm specifically thinking about uh, language uh, MOOCs. The project uh, Ivana mentioned there was the Moonlight project, which um, the, you can find the website there. We got a lot of publications and talks. So I'm not going to go into too much general detail about this project because you can you can find out more about it um, there. The motivation for it was that back in 2015, with the refugee crisis, there was um, well, not, I wouldn't call it a need, more of a desire from a lot of academics to try and support um, inclusive ed education and uh, social justice, etc. The big problem in a way, which is obvious, is that a lot of refugees and migrants aren't terribly keen in participating in on online learning, which is not really surprising because they feel marginalized, they feel isolated, and what they really want are quality face-to-face -face classes. But unfortunately, this is not really um, possible. So what we we're trying to do was overcome these uh, limitations and if you like this slight like prejudice, perhaps on their part to online learning and think about how we could actually uh, engage with them and uh, to get them learning and studying with us. Okay, and if there's just one go home message from this, uh, this brief presentation that I would give you, it's the importance to work with the people who work with them, the non-governmental organization and uh, in this case, refugee support groups and to channel your educational um, activities via this uh, specific group and this is what we did I mean when the project was kicked off um, ends of 2016 really I suppose it was the start of 2017 we got in contact with um, over 20 non-governmental uh, organization ACNUR, um, Red Cross etc etc we had a big kickoff meeting in Madrid and we didn't go along as the the people who knew everything about this to try and tell them what this uh, issue was about we went along and listened we listened to what the, they thought the needs of the refugees and migrants were, and then we helped them to understand what we had to offer from that. And then from this initial meeting, we moved on to have work sessions engaged in design thinking, and that's what really led 
to the uh, the MOOCs that we actually um, we built uh, for them. So we started off with the general questionnaire and interviews. And um, as I said, we moved on to have working sessions with them. And the interesting, and I would say amazingly positive uh, uh, part of this was that the actual teachers from the refugee support groups and some of the refugees and migrants themselves actually participated in the development of the materials for the courses. And also at the same time were actors in the videos. And I think that helped enormously to um, bring us closer together and uh, make sure we were on the right page for their for their needs. I mean some data about this I'm not going to go through it in um, a lot of a lot of depth here but you can see the age range between 21 and 40 with a good uh, mixture of uh, male and female, um, a typical um, Arab and French background and uh, we were working with them to help them learn Spanish although uh, it could also be applied to other, other languages as well. They didn't necessarily have access to classroom uh, situations, but they did typically have access to some kind of mobile device or smartphone they could use for their education. And um, as I said, one of the problems we, we had to overcome at the beginning was, was really a question of engagement and motivation. And uh, it's a classic kind of problem. A lot of uh, big education providers, for example, um, Coursera, I don't particularly want to criticize them because I think their courses are very good, but you typically hear them saying, oh yes, we've offered our MOOCs for free for, for refugees and migrants. But the problem is, is they are full of white middle class, middle age um, actors as teachers. And uh, that tends to, if you like, separate the problem more than actually work towards yeah. a, a solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we started to think about um, building some language MOOCs and how we could actually scaffold these courses to actually connect with, the, uh, with, the, with our student population. We had a really positive design thinking workshop. We got everyone together and um, brainstorming, got some general ideas. And then from that, we we're able to structure these ideas and the sorts of content to identify the sorts of materials that the people um, would actually want to to learn. So we came up with two language MOOCs, um, Portas Abiertas in Spanish, Open Doors. Um, these are a continuous language MOOCs for about six weeks each course with an A1, A2 plus language uh, um, level following the, the common European framework of reference for languages. And we did as much as possible to make these courses um, inclusive in, in all shapes and uh, in the forms. We've actually, uh, we did some theoretical work on the use of inclusive language and our course facilitators were actually specifically trained because as you can possibly uh, probably imagine a lot of the or oh, quite a few of the refugees who were participating in these courses had quite a sad story to tell and were were slightly traumatized and uh, it was very difficult to get them to open up and to become uh, communicative which of course is fundamental for language learning but a uh, little by little we did this okay you've got the structure of the the two courses here and these were typical kinds of scenarios that were of interest to the uh, the people on this um, on these courses. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to read them out here, but uh, you've got them there on the screen. Um, we learned as we went along that we were going to need to uh, scaffold these courses in uh, in uh, complementary and specific ways, focusing on six specific aspects here. Which I'm not, once again I'm not going to go into any, in any great detail for lack of time here. This whole question of of usability. Um, the fact uh, these courses need to be deployed well on mobile uh, um, devices and also have the, uh, the students have the possibility to be able to um, download the materials when they're not when they're connected to use when they're not and um, basically uh, a whole range of uh, different issues focused on how we were going to actually work with them on the uh, on the courses and since a lot of these students actually came along with an oral learning uh, tradition of, of repetition then we needed to think about how we could actually get them to focus on aspects of language learning and the different uh, competencies which um, a priori would not necessarily feel very uh, natural um, to them but, uh, but we managed to uh, we managed to do that uh, specifically in terms of second language uh, scaffolding we uh, we did this linguistically by by providing um, if you like cultural and um, and uh, social underpinning to the uh, the sorts of language they were using in the uh, uh, courses and as I said before by using uh, a, an inclusive language to always try and engage with them and not be judgmental or critical of uh, the sorts of uh, uh, comments and uh, conversations and, and activities actually came across in the um, in the forums in the, the different uh, um, activities. We also provided um, specific scaffolding 
providing uh, summaries, transcriptions, and complementary material, specifically in, in, in French and, and Arab, Arabic, obviously, because you're talking about an A1, A2 plus level, you really do need to provide this sort of uh, multilingual uh, approach. And we worked on all, all four of the, uh, the language competences uh, throughout the course. Some quantitative data for you um, of these courses, I think, uh, the perhaps the, the the most telling interesting feature here is that of the the over 2000 registered students we had on these courses more than 30 percent of them actually completed which is actually uh, quite high because typically on language MOOCs or typically on MOOCs you're looking at somewhere in the region of uh, of 10 percent um 7 to 15 10 percent um finishing so that's actually quite uh, quite high and within the courses 96 to 98 percent of the activities were actually um finished by them. Um, even though these, these MOOCs were intended to be used uh, completely autonomously by the students online, because some of the, the people participating in the preparation of these courses were in fact language teachers from NGOs and, and uh, refugee support groups, we actually um, encouraged them to use them in a blended learning fashion. So in fact they could actually dedicate some of their classroom time with the small groups of students to focus on some of the issues that actually came up during the MOOC and to prepare them, resolve doubts and stuff. So uh, this is actually something which, uh, which worked, uh, worked quite well. Okay, some general conclusions. This was a preliminary exploratory uh, uh, study. We've, um, this, this project's finished, finished in 2019, but we've carried on to uh, run second and third editions of these uh, of these uh, courses and um, even now they are available if you want to, to look at them or, or use them. The only thing is we're not actually um, attending the forums at the moment because we can't be doing that all the time. So they're locked down in read-only mode but the resources, um, uh, open resources are, are there and once again they can be used as, uh, to complement uh, um, you know face-to-face -face learning giving rise to a blended uh, um, approach. Um, inclusive MOOCs um, are definitely possible. A lot of care is needed to um, to work with your your, your student population, and uh, I think one of the temptations that we have to overcome as uh, as teachers and language teachers is that we're often quite keen to jump in the swimming pool with them and to to get close and to try and work directly, and that is not always the most effective uh, policy. Sometimes it's it's uh, more effective as to use the, the term I like to use is to identify. Um, educational proxies. These are people from their own uh, cult social culture group who, if you like, have more affinity and can can work on a more fluid basis with them. So we can we can be in the background, if you like, providing the the pedagogy and the, the language learning, and then the uh, the proxies can actually work with the. Uh, with the, with the students and um, we still have a very good relationship with um, with a lot of these uh, uh, students they're very keen to uh, to carry on studying with us and we're working on different kinds of um, um, type projects of this of this uh, of this nature with them but um, I think it's been a very positive experience it's been it's been great for them but at the same time it's been great for us because I think um, as I said at the the beginning of this brief presentation the key um, thing here was really to go along with uh, with an intention of learning because it's tempting sometimes to think okay yes I've been teaching languages for 30 years I know how this is done this is quite easy and jump in and uh, sometimes you need to I think in order to to generate a spirit of inclusiveness and uh, and connection with a, a wide and multilingual range of people it's actually important to actually stop and, and listen to them in a way and then develop the curriculum between the two of you between what they want, sometimes they don't know what they want at the beginning, and, and what you can offer. And I think uh, I think that's uh, it's worked quite well in uh, in this case. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tim. I'm glad that uh, Anthony, uh, well, my my colleague from Knowledge Innovation Center, uh, suggested to include this uh, this view on multilingual education because I think that very often when we speak about these inclusive uh, projects and inclusive practices, we forget about the potential that uh, that uh, these computer supported uh, technologies can can give and how MOOCs can be incorporated um, when when we are speaking about uh, multilingual 
global uh, classrooms. So I think that we have uh, also a nice uh, diversity of uh, target groups presented in the cases and also a nice diversity of different uh, tools that, uh, that you use uh, uh, to achieve uh, inclusive classrooms. Um, thank you all for presenting. I think that we can now also move to, uh, to questions uh, from the audience. If there are any questions, I, I saw one which was uh, anyone have had experience using symbols for improving communication. Um, does anybody want to take on that uh, question and answer? Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, sorry. Can I speak? Uh, usually we use chat, but uh, ah, was yeah, so you who, who asked the question? No, no, no. I, I, I wanted to share my experience. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, my name is Anna. I, I, I'm Russian, but I live in the Netherlands. And uh, my daughter, she has Down syndrome. Uh, so the sign language uh, is used, and especially was used before she actually started to speak, actually to help her to communicate, uh, because uh, it's easier for. I think it's overall for all children, but especially for children with uh, special needs to use sign, signs rather than to speak. And, and for example, like at kindergarten, or she could communicate that she wants to go to the toilet by using the sign, uh, instead of actually just, you know, using the diaper, for example. Uh, and then now the, also the speech therapists uses uh, it as like, for example, to build the whole sentences. Uh, and uh, she, can, uh, she, she thinks it can help her to Actually, she thought it will help her to activate the speech, which is the case now. Uh, but before, in many cases, she was just using a sign instead of uh, saying the word because she could not uh, articulate it. Mm. So I don't know if I, yeah, if if uh, if it helps someone, but uh, yeah. So I think it's uh, a good method to 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 invest. Uh, and even in the Netherlands, I know that they use sign language for regular kids uh, because also it, it helps. I, I saw a couple of times in the street, like maybe eight eight months old child can show that he, he wants to to drink, for example, uh, or if it's enough, something for him using the sign because I also know the sign. And uh, this is how it's, it's very funny because it's, it's very small, like uh, uh, s s small, small person, but already you see like, um, yeah, like it's that it's, a hu it's like human being and, and there is a sense in all this, <laughs> what they're doing and not just crying in, 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 the, in the stroller. Yeah, thank you, Anna. I think that uh, in multi-include database, we did have uh, uh, two cases that were uh, mentioning sign language and uh, support to uh, to kids with uh, Down syndrome. I would need to to go through uh, multi uh, multi uh, uh, multi include database to to see. You can also browse through the website and check. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's a um, good thing to consider uh, how the sign language can uh, can help. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, any other comments? I think that Mari had, uh, you raised the hand, so yes. Yes, please. well, I was wondering if we are talking about symbols or signs, and because if we were also talking about symbols, just in general to help communication, one thing we did in primary school with our really young students that just could not express themselves in one of the school languages, we gave them small um, symbols, symbolic cards with which they could show if they if they needed help, if they needed to go to the toilet, just a couple of simple images. And, and then we, we got, um, we made sure that we found a way to communicate with the parent and sat down with each child, making sure they understand each card. And, and we put the cards in a small um, key holder that they always kept with themselves so that they had a really simple tool just to communicate the basic needs that they could have. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that these were two different uh, cases. One was the question about uh, um, the symbols. The other one was about the uh, sign language, but uh, it, it can complement one another uh, or so it, it seems. Yeah. Any other questions uh, from the audience? 
or any comment uh, question from from our speakers if not um then i would uh, thank everyone for participation uh the recording from the webinar will be uploaded to a multi include web page probably tomorrow and in the meantime i invite you to to check multi include website because we had many new things uh, uploaded to uh, to the project uh, we launched also uh, inclusion matrix um, which i did prepare uh, to to share how it looks let me just find one of the screens that i want to share uh, because we are, as I said, we are closing the projects and we are now in the in the last phase, so everything is already available for uh, for people to um, to check and test. Um, so this is, for example, multi include MOOC that we built uh, that you can enroll to. It's the enrollment is still on Pathways to Inclusive Education. Uh, there are uh, six different, seven different modules, but the one that was uh, added after COVID was module five, inclusive learning in digital space, that you might all find useful now that we moved uh, uh, teaching online um, and how to make it more inclusive. That was the MOOC that we built. Uh, then there is the multi-include database. You can go here in tools and resources, detect good practice database, and it's uh, all the 70 plus cases that we mentioned are here, for example, SESB that you can check um, using Scratch for disability, uh, the case from Italy, how uh, this uh, software is using uh, being used by, uh, by kids with uh, learning disabilities. So you can browse different uh, cases um, and find something that you can maybe implement in your own context. Then you can join our uh, learning uh, community. If you go to knowledge exchange and to learning community, you would end up on a page looking something like this, uh, where you can access inclusion matrix uh, resources, equity blogs written by uh, community members, and you can see who is in the community already. Um, the inclusion matrix is the thing that I wanted to mention. It's the uh, something that is uh, built by Kinder um, Children's University in Vienna. Uh, it's inclusion matrix that basically um, helps you assess uh, how is your uh, inclusion readiness based on admission and access, social interaction, student and participant support, management, teaching, extracurricular activities, community outreach and assessment and recognition. So basically inside of each of these is a survey that you fill in and then you, uh, you can get your results. And it is a starting point for self-reflection and the dialogue uh, between school leadership and teachers, how to improve inclusive practices. Then you can also access uh, in the knowledge exchange and learning community, you have policy reports, toolkit manuals, interviews, academic papers and uh, project outputs but you need to register as a, a learning community member to access these and it's constantly being um, updated with new papers that we are receiving and resources that people are sharing with us so feel free to uh, share different materials and um, this is also uh, inside the tools and resources inside the impact um, is the online tool but you can also have the inclusion matrix offline version if you want to have uh, workshops in schools um, and you can also become a part of our school network because so far we piloted uh, inclusion matrix uh, in more than 30 schools and we are looking for um, other people who are willing to other schools who are willing to to join and um, test our tool um, that was all from from us and thank you. Yes, it's an impressive project. Uh, I feel in a way sorry that it's ending because it's been three years uh, and it's very hard to depart from it. But I think that uh, uh, we can we learned a lot from it and we can build new projects uh, and new initiatives from there. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, hope to see you in some other uh, inclusion events and uh, keep up the good practices.